Hi guys, I'm excited to keep going with our reading. Um, so let's get started. There we go. Okay. Here we go, protector. My family, which humans call a troop, was just like any gorilla family. There were 10 of us, my father, the silverback, my mother and three other adult females, a juvenile male called a blackback and two other young gorillas. Tag and I were the babies of the group. We squabbled now and then as families will, but my father knew how to keep us in line with a simple scowl. And for the most part, we were happy to do what we were meant to do, to feed and forage and nap and play. My father was a master at leading us to the ripest fruit for our morning feast and the finest branches for our night nests. He was everything a silverback was meant to be, a guide, a teacher, a protector and nobody could chess beat like my father. A perfect life. Gorilla babies and elephant babies and human babies are not so different, except that a gorilla gets to spend the day riding on his mother's back, like a cowboy on a horse. It's a pretty great system. From the baby's point of view, slowly, carefully, a young gorilla begins to venture farther and farther away from the safety of his mother's arms. He learns the skills he will need as an adult. How to make a nest of branches, weave them tightly, or they will fall apart in the middle of the night. How to beat your chest, cup your palms to amplify the sound. How to go vining from tree to tree, don't let go. How to be kind, be strong, be loyal. Growing up gorilla is just like any other kind of growing up. You make mistakes. You play, you learn, you do it all over again. It was, for a while, a perfect life. The end. One day, a still day, when the hot air hummed, the humans came. Vine. After they captured my sister and me, they put us in a cramped, dark crate that smelled of urine and fear. Somehow I knew that in order to live, I had to let my old life die. But my sister could not let go of our home. It held her like a vine, stretching across the miles comforting, strangling. We were still in our crate when she looked at me without seeing, and I knew that the vine had finally snapped. A temporary human. It was Mac who pried open that crate, Mac who bought me, and Mac who raised me like a human baby. I wore diapers, I drank from a bottle, I slept in, a, in human beds, sat in human chairs, listened while human words swarmed around me like angry bees. Mac had a wife back then. Helen was quick to laugh, but quick to anger too, especially when I broke something, which was often. Here's what I broke while I lived with Mac and Helen. One crib, 46 glasses, Seven lamps, one couch, three shower curtains, three shower curtain rods, one blender, one TV, one radio, three toes, my own. I broke the blender when I squeezed, ugh, excuse me. I broke the blender when I squeezed three tubes of toothpaste and a bottle of glue in it, into it. I broke my toes attempting to swing from a lamp fixture on the ceiling. I broke 46 glasses. Well, it turns out there are many ways to break a glass. 
Every weekend, Mac and Helen took me in their convertible to a fast food restaurant where they ordered me fries and a strawberry shake. Mac loved to see the expression on the cashier's face when he drove up and said, could I have some extra ketchup for my kid? I went to baseball games, to the grocery store, to the movie theater, even to the circus. They didn't have a gorilla. I rode like, excuse me, I rode a little motorbike and blew out candles on a birthday cake. My life as a human was a glamorous one. Although my parents, traditional sorts, would not have approved. Oh, look, there's baby Ivan. Hunger. My new life as a human, I was, in my new life as a human, I was well tended. I ate lettuce leaves with Thousand Island dressing and caramel apples and, a pop, and popcorn with butter. My belly ballooned. But hunger, like food, comes in many shapes and colors. At night, lying alone in my poo pajamas, I felt hungry for the skilled touch of a grooming friend, for the cheerful grunts of a playful fight, for the easy safety of my nearby troop, foraging through shadows. Remember what happened to Tag? I told myself, don't think about the jungle. Still, sometimes I lay awake, wishing for the warmth of another just like me, asleep in a night nest of tender prayer plant leaves. I liked having sips of soda poured into my mouth like a bubbling waterfall, but every now and then I longed to search for a tender stalk of arrowroot to fill the teas of a mango just out of reach. Still life. One day, Helen came home from, with something large and flat, wrapped in brown paper. Look what I bought today, she said excitedly as she tore off the paper. A painting to go over the living room couch. Fruit in a bowl, Max said with a shrug. Big deal. This is fine art. It's called a still life, Helen explained and I think it's lovely. I dashed over to examine the painting, marveling at the colors and shapes. See, said Max's wife, Ivan likes it. Ivan likes to roll up poop and throw it at it, squirrels, Max said. I couldn't take my eyes off the apples and bananas and grapes in the picture. They look so real, so inviting, so edible. I reached out to touch a grape, and Helen slapped my hand. Bad boy, Ivan. Don't touch. She jerked her thumb at Mac. Honey, go get a hammer and a nail, would you? While Mac and Helen were busy in the living room, I wandered into the kitchen. A cake covered in thick chocolate frosting sat on the counter. I like cake. Love it, in fact. But it wasn't eating I was thinking about. It was painting. The frosting peaked and dipped like waves on a tiny pond. It looked rich and gooey, dark and smooth. It looked like mud. I scooped up a handful of frosting, frosting. I scooped up another. I headed to the refrigerator door. It was perfect. An empty, white, waiting canvas. The frosting wasn't as easy to work with as jungle mud. It was thicker and, of course, more tempting to eat. But I kept at it. I scraped off every last bit of that frosting. I may have eaten a little cake too. 
I don't remember what I was trying to paint, paint, a banana most likely. I suppose I knew I was going to get in trouble, but at that moment, I just didn't care. I wanted to make something, anything, the way I used to. I wanted to be an artist again. Punishment. I soon learned that humans can screech even louder than monkeys. After that, I was never allowed in the kitchen. Babies. Back in those days, the big top mall was smaller. It had a pony ride, a wooden train that bustled around the parking lot, a few bed rail parrots, and a surly spider monkey. But then Mac bought me, a baby gorilla dressed in a crisp tuxedo, to the mall. Everything changed. People came from far and wide to have their pictures taken with me. They brought me blocks and a toy guitar. They held me in their laps. Once I even held a baby in mine. She was small and slippery. Bubbles flowed from her lips. She squeezed my fingers. Her rear was puffy with padding. Her legs bowed like bent twigs. I made a face. She made a face. I grunted. She grunted. I was so afraid she would fall that I squeezed her tightly and her mother yanked her away. I wonder if my mother ever worried about dropping us. We always held on, but it's easier, excuse me, but that's easier to do when your mother is furry. Human babies are an ugly lot, but their eyes are like our baby's eyes. Too big for their face and for the world. Beds. One day, after many weeks of loud talking, Helen packed a bag and slammed the front door and never came back. I don't know why. I never know the why of humans. That night, I slept with Mac in his bed. My old nests were woven of leaves and sticks and shaped like his bathtub, cool green cocoons. Mac's bed, like mine, was flat, hot, without sticks or stars. Still, he made a sleeping sound, like the rumble my father used to make when all was well, a sound from deep inside his belly. My place. Mac grew sullen. I grew bigger. I became what I was meant to be. Too large for chairs, too strong for hugs, and too big for human life. I tried to stay calm, to move with dignity. I did my best to eat daintily. But human ways are hard to learn, especially when you are not human. When I saw my new domain, I was thrilled. And who wouldn't have been? It had no furniture to break, no glasses to smash, no, no toilets to drop max keys into. It even had a tire swing. I was relieved to have my own place. Somehow, I didn't realize I'd be here quite so long. Now I drink Pepsi, eat old apples, watch reruns on TV. Oh, there's his tire swing. But many days I forget what I'm supposed to be. Am I a human? Am I a gorilla? Humans have so many words, more than they truly need. Still, they have no name for what I am. Nine thousand eight hundred and six, or excuse me, nine thousand eight hundred and seventy-six days. Ruby is finally asleep. I watch her chest rise and fall. Bob too is snoring. But my mind is still racing. For perhaps the first time ever, I've been remembering. It's an odd story to remember, I have to admit. My story has a strange shape, a stunted beginning, an endless middle. 
Throughout all the days I've lived with humans, gorillas count as well as anyone, although it's not a particularly useful skill to have in the world, or in the wild. I've forgotten so many things, and yet I've always known precisely how many days I've been in my domain. I take one of the magic markers Julia gave me and make an X, a small one, on my painted jungle wall. I make more X's and more. I make an X for every day of my life with humans. My marks look like this. So look at his little X's. The rest of the night, I mark the days. When I'm done, my wall looks like this. And so on until there are 9,000. 876 X's marching across my wall like a parade of ugly insects. A visit. It's almost morning when I hear steps. It's Mac. He has a sharp smell. He weaves as he walks. He stands next to my domain. His eyes are red. He is staring out the window at the empty parking lot. Ivan, my man, he mumbles. Ivan. He presses his forehead against the glass. We've been through a lot, you and me. A new beginning. We don't see Matt for two days. When he returns, he doesn't talk about Stella. He says he is anxious to re teach Ruby some tricks. He says the billboard is bringing in more visitors. He says it's time for a new beginning. All afternoon and into the evening, Mac works with Ruby. Ruby's feet are looped with ropes that she can't run, cannot run. Heavy chains hang off her neck. Mac shows her Stella's ball, her pedestal her stool. He introduces her to Snickers. When Ruby obeys, Mac gives her a cube of sugar or a, dry, or a bit of dried apple. When he, she doesn't, he yells and kicks at the sawdust. While George and, excuse me, when George and Julia arrive, Mac is still training Ruby. Julia sits on a bench and watches him. She draws a little, but mostly she keeps her eyes on the ruby. Bob watches too. He's hiding in the corner of my domain under not tab. It's raining outside and Bob doesn't like damp feet. Ruby trudges behind Mac, her head drooping. Endlessly, they circle the ring. Sometimes Mac slaps her plank with his hand. Suddenly, Ruby jerks to a stop. Mac pulls the chain hard, but Ruby refuses to move. Come on, Ruby. Mac is almost pleading. What's your problem? She's exhausted, I say to myself. That's the problem. Mac groans. Idiot elephant. Idiot human, Bob mutter mutters. Walk, Ruby, I say, although I know she's too far away to hear me. Do what he says. Walk, Mac commands. Now. Ruby doesn't walk. She plops her rump on the sawdust floor. I think maybe she's tired, Julia says. Mac wipes his forehead with the back of his arm. Yeah, I know. We're all tired. He pushes Ruby with the heel of his boot. She ignores him. George looks over from the food court where he is wiping off tables. Mac, he yells, maybe you should call it a day. I'll close up. Mac yanks at Ruby, on Ruby's chain. She's as anchored as a tree trunk. He pulls harder and falls to his knees. That does it, Mac says. He brushes sawdust off his jeans. I'm through playing around. Mac stomps off to his office. When he returns, he's holding, he's carrying a long stick. 
The gleaming hook on its end is almost beautiful. It's like a sliver of moon. It's a claw stick. Mac pokes Ruby with a sharp point. Not hard, just a touch. I can tell he wants her to see how much it can hurt. I growl low in my throat. Ruby doesn't budge. She is gray, unmoving boulder. She closes her eyes, and for a moment, I wonder if she might have fallen asleep. I'm warning you, Max says. He breathes out and stares at the ceiling. Ruby makes a huffing sound. Fine, Max says. You want to play that? It play it that way. He draws back the claw stick. No, Julia cries. I'm not gonna hurt her, Max says. I just want to get her attention. Bob snarls. Max swings. The hook slices the air just a few inches above Ruby's head. See why you don't want to mess with me, Max says. He draws back the claw stick again. Now move! Ruby jerks her head, flinging her trunk towards Mac. She makes a noise that sends the sawdust scattering. It makes my glass shiver. It's the most beautiful man that I've ever heard. Ruby's trunk slaps into Mac. I don't see exactly where she strikes him. Somewhere below his stomach, I think. And I know he must be uncomfortable because Mac drops the claw stick and falls down to the ground and curls into a ball and howls like a baby. Direct hit, Bob says. Poor Mac. Mac groans. He stumbles to his feet and hobbles off towards his office. Ruby watches him leave. I can't read her expression. Is she afraid? Relieved? Proud? When Mac is gone, George and Julia lead Ruby from the ring. It's okay, baby. It's okay, Julia says, stroking Ruby's head. They settle Ruby in her domain and make sure she has fresh food, water and food. Before long, Ruby is dozing. Dad? Julia asks George, or asks as George locks Ruby's iron door. Do you think Mac would ever hurt Ruby? I don't think so, Jules, George says. At least I hope not. Maybe we could call someone. George scratches his chin. I wish I could help Ruby, but I wouldn't know how. I mean, who would I call? The elephant cops? Besides, George looks down. I need this job, Jules. We need this job. Your mom, the doctor bills. He kisses the top of Julia's head. Back to work, you and me both. Julia sighs and reaches for her backpack. She removes a piece of paper, a bottle of water, and a small metal box. Homework first, Jules, George says, wagging a finger. Then you can pick. It's for art class, Julia explains. We're doing watercolors. I'm going to paint Ruby. George smiles. All right, then. Just don't forget your spelling. Dad, Julia asks again. Did you see Mac's face when Ruby hit him? George nods. Yes, he says solemnly. I did. He shakes his head. Poor, poor Mac. He turns away, and only then do I hear him laughing. Okay, guys, that's it for today. Go look at the questions. Make sure you remember that you can always come back here and reread and make sure that you use complete sentences and send a picture to your teacher. Bye, guys.